Hello， 大家好，我系 Professor Lisa Lang， 我系岭南大学文化研究系嘅一个老师。我哋文化研究其实咧都系一啲即系直住从日常生活啦，所接触嘅东西，包括系媒体啦。誒普及文化啦，甚至係一啲嘅誒生活性嘅一啲嘅課題咧，去思考一啲更加大嘅啲議題，誒包括文化啦、社會啦、政治啦，甚至經濟嘅啲課題嘅。而我哋嘅課程嘅特色咧，就係、是、誒不斷係去邀請一啲唔同嘅一啲業界嘅人士啦，嚇，甚至係一啲嘅即係誒知名啲嘅人士咧，去進入我哋嘅課堂裏邊咧，係作出佢哋嘅分享。而誒，我哋咧即將會係推出一系列嘅一啲嘅短片咧，係記錄一啲呢啲嘅誒所謂客席嘅分享咧，係誒希望可以誒令大家更加明白我哋嗰個課程嘅宗旨啦，以及係我哋一啲嘅課堂嘅內容，使到咧大家係即使未係去參與我哋嘅課堂咧，都可以更加了解我哋嗰個關注同埋我哋一啲嘅興趣嘅。咁、呃、或者你哋都可以係去 follow 我哋嗰個社交媒體嘅網站啦，係、啊、更加了解我哋呢、這個即係、就是、學士嘅課程嚇，同、啊、埋我哋一啲嘅即係科目嘅嚇。咁啊,啊，請大家去 enjoy。This is CUS Free Field One Four Hong Kong Popular Culture. This school aims to provide students with a critical introduction to popular culture in Hong Kong. Students will learn to assess for themselves the form, meaning, and significance of popular culture, as well as to analyze the foundation of the cultural and social identity of Hong Kong people through concrete case studies. Students will study popular culture as something more than leisurely entertainment, because this is a cultural process already inscribed in the relations of power. Students will be asked to analyze the politics of Hong Kong popular culture in its particular historical and geopolitical conditions, including marginal, post-colonial, post-modern, cosmopolitan, translational, and perpetually transiting. The course will draw on, but is not limited to this critical perspective, including post-colonial criticism, anthropological and sociological readings, gender theory, and media and film studies. Specific topics will be selected from areas such as the changing cultural status of Hong Kong through the post-war decades, Western and Asian influences, and the transformation of indigenous cultures, drama and TV as mass entertainment. The consumption and politics of popular music, electronic media, the print media, and the dichotomy between public and private. Characteristics in Hong Kong cinema in the last thirty years or so. Um, for a history of Hong Kong cinema after the Second World War, that is 1945. The Second World War ended in 1945. Uh, it's a, it's a lot. Uh, Hong Kong cinema has produced a variety of genres and has quite a bit of contribution to global cinema as well. Um, I would say Hong Kong cinema uh, uniquely invented the Kung Fu martial art genre. Kung Fu martial art is hand to hand combat. Um, anyway, today we are not going to talk about Kung Fu or Bu Chi. That I talked about a lot in classes, as well as for Yvonne Song Kong popular culture in the past couple of years. I refer you to the PowerPoint slide number one. Altogether, I have 79. Okay. 79 slides. Slide number one, this is the title uh, slide Postmodern Features Hong Kong Cinema. Two, slide two. Postmodern features in Hong Kong pop culture. Now, before I cite examples from Hong Kong cinema to illustrate postmodern characteristics or postmodern features, let's go through very quickly and in very simple ways what we mean by postmodern characteristics or what we mean by uh, yeah, postmodernity or postmodernism. All right. First, in Hong Kong popular culture, what do you mean by postmodernism or postmodernity? Slide number three, slide number three. Now, ever since the 1980s, ever since, um, yeah, through, through the 1980s, toward the end of the 1980s, stepping into the 1990s, postmodernism became a very, very popular term in academy, in the humanities, and also in social science, people use it. Uh, 
And then in popular discourse or in popular life or in everyday language, in journalism and so on, people adopted the term because it sounded cool. Uh, it, it still sounds cool, although it's, it's been 30 years. Uh, people attach holes to a lot of terms. And in Chinese, we have a term. Okay, for those of you who can read Chinese, you will get it from the sky. All right. And just there, just uh, one more remark before we go on to slide number four. Uh, the term postmodern was not new. It uh, appeared uh, one or two hundred years ago. People check out in the English usage of it. Um, so it, it dates back to a couple of hundred years. But it, back then, it didn't mean what we mean today. Now, in our current times, the use of the term postmodern first emerged in architecture in the 1970s. Actually, it first emerged in the 1970s in architecture and gradually picked up by people doing cultural analysis, people in the humanities. Okay? So it's nothing, and postmodernism itself actually is nothing new. All the ingredients are so-called features in postmodern. There's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. It's just that in the in what we call postmodernity, we live in postmodernity. Those features are intensified and are came to the forefront. And there's a combination of specific features. Okay, let's move on. Slide number four. Uh, here is a list of some of the commonly seen post uh, terms like post structuralism, postmodernism, post colonial studies, post feminism, post human, post industrial society, post contemporary, post theory, and post everything, and including postman. But right now in Hong Kong, post stage delivery uh, has been partially suspended. So postman, some postman got sick. Okay, anyway, postman has nothing to do with what we talk about post here, okay. Okay, now, since it became very cool, uh, after the 19, since the 1990s, the term post, post, this post that became very cool. People attached it to almost anything, and sometimes it didn't make sense. Now, when Hong Kong stepped into uh, the 1990s, Hong Kong was in a period of transition, returning to uh, China. So some people call it the post-transitional period back then. What? It was the late transitional period, not post-transitional, because before 1997, it was before the transition. So, but anyway, if you check the news back then, uh, yeah, a lot of the reporters use the term, oh, before 1997, okay? In the last several years running up to 1997. A lot of people use it. Oh, we are now in the post transitional period in Hong Kong. Oh, well, well, well. And uh, currently, actually, I have heard from time to time people referring to the condition, the uh, health condition, the global pandemic condition in some, in some places. Some governments already call it an endemic instead of a pandemic. But anyway, so some people refer to our current pandemic situation as post-COVID-19 period. Oh, come on. We are still in COVID-19. It's not post yet. All right, let's move on. Now, slide six, slide six. What's the difference between postmodernism and postmodernity? Now, postmodernity in Chinese is ho jian dai xing, okay, how yin dai sing, usually we say. And postmodernism is ho jian dai zhu yi, how yin dai zhu yi. So, uh, slide seven, slide seven. Well, in brief, when we use the term, it is in brief for convenience sake. We, we say that when we use the term postmodernism, we refer to uh, artistic creation, okay, to the arts, so postmodernism, postmodern art. And when we talk about, when we use the term postmodernity, we, we refer to the social condition that we are living in, all right? Postmodernity, our social condition. Postmodernism artistic and cultural creation. Okay, slide number seven, three kinds of postmodernism. Once again, for convenience sake, it is not absolute truth or I think it's not the only skin to understand postmodernism. All right, 
So it is for convenience sake that a lot of people will say there are three kinds of postmodernism. Okay, one, slide number seven again, slide number seven. This is a kind of artistic style, right? Stephen Chow, Zhao Xingqi, okay, Chow Xingqi. And Wong Kar Wai is very postmodern. They are very different, yet they are, they each of them carries different postmodern artistic features in their film. Okay, second kind, post-structuralism, and deconstructive scholarly approaches. So that is theory. That is how we analyze culture and society using postmodern perspective. So that is a sense of postmodernism. The third sense is a description of post-industrial society, and we will say post-modernity a lot of times. All right. Slide eight, slide eight, modernism and modernity. Now, before we go on to post-modernism, let's uh, once again very quickly look at what do we mean by modernity? What do we mean by modernism? Um, okay, now modernism is not over. Well, some theories would argue that, well, we are still living in a transition between modern and postmodern, and some theories, some critics would argue that, well, postmodernism is actually part of modernity. Uh, it, it would sound confusing, but anyway, in brief, what do we mean by we are being modern? Now, modernity, of course, is a Western thing, it's a European thing. Uh, well, modernity is a very short history if you measure it against human civilization. Uh, roughly, you could date back to the uh, Renaissance or Renaissance or Renaissance in European history that first began in the 14th century in, in Italy. And then in the 16th century, 17th century, it became all rice bread in Europe. More than as in opposition to the Middle Ages. So what are some of the um, characteristics of being modern? Well, we have been being modern for just a couple of hundred years. So. What's what's so modern? Slide number eight. So in in modernity, historically, we see the rise of modern science and modern technology. So science and technology is a very important part. And uh, for a couple of decades, we have been enjoying high tech digital technology, and now we are using digital technology, virtual reality. This is part of oh, virtual reality is very postmodern. Everything is unreal. Postmodernism. The real has become. Uh, the real is disappearing. I mean, conceptually, theoretically, the academics would argue. And uh, am I real or you are just watching a video? You don't know, right? I don't know who I am. I may be just a hologram. Okay. Now, second thing is in the modern times, there was also the rise of industry, industrialism, or the industrial revolution. And rationalism, that is a rise of reasonable thinking. We often say uh, Li Xing, uh, Li Xing Tao Lun. When people say let's let's conduct a Li Xing Tao Lun, or let's conduct a rational reasoning argument, that person, he himself or herself, is not rational already because he or she asks other people to be rational. Come on. <laughs> now, bear in mind that. When one is drunk, one would deny that he or she is drunk, okay? Now, anyway, in modernism, we use rational thinking. And then in modernism, we prefer, we prefer structure. Everything has to be in order, okay, in a kind of organization. And humanism, yes, the rise of humanism. Right now, we have the Ukraine war. And there's a lot of inhumane war atrocities going on. So humanism, that is, we put human beings in the center of our life, in the center of the world. Nothing is more important than human beings themselves. Nothing is more important than human life, humanism. We care about ourselves. We care about fairness, justice, liberty, equality. So democracy leads to us to, uh, in, 1789, it is a year of significance, 1789. Oh, by the way, let me ask you a question. Now I have uh, 49 of you. Could anyone just speak up what is the significance of 1789? Use your Google if you don't know. Could anyone just uh, give us, give uh, Yvonne and me some audio response? If you don't want to show your face. 
Hello, anyone? 1789, 1789. Anyone would like to say something? Just make a guess. Living in a digital age, information is easily accessible in most places in the world. Right now in Russia, it would be very difficult for you to get access freely to the internet. Anyway. 1789 was the uh, very famous French Revolution, overthrowing uh, the monarchy, overthrowing Louis Louis what, Louis the Sixteenth, and established uh, the Republic. And so uh, the champion slogan of the French Revolution that took place in 1789 is: We still use it, okay? Equality, fraternity, liberty. So, okay, so that's part of modernity. Okay, and rule of law, which is different than rule by law. Okay, rule of law. So, okay, all those are essential characteristics of living in modernity. Now, next slide, eight, slide nine, slide nine. Now, what about the postmodern challenge to postmodernity? Postmodern challenge to modernity. Now, um, critics and theorists argue that. Uh, Postmodernism is not a break, it's not a clean break from modernism. It is a transition, or it is a transformation of modernism. Or postmodernism is an intensification of some modern features. And now let's look at some of the important characteristics of what do we mean by postmodern? Decentering power. So decentering is a very important concept. While in uh, modernity, we emphasize in modernity and modernism, we emphasize structure and order. And in postmodernism, well, people just break away from the center or trying to break down the center, or trying to check the center. So the centering is a very important concept. No one is going to dominate the others. Every individual person is the same, is equally important. So you need you don't need one single leader to do anything. Okay? You don't need one single government. Decentering the concept of man itself, so man, human beings, which is very important in the Renaissance. And the self is fragmented, so you are not that reasonable, you are not really a reasoning being, because you know, a lot of times we are overcome by, overwhelmed by our emotions and so on, it's very complex. And debunking the network, nothing is network, everything is constructed. And debunking truth. Truth is difficult to get to. Now, some people will deny the existence of truth. Some people will say that it is very difficult to get to. Now, well, you're too young for the X Files, okay, which was a big hit uh, from the 1990s, a big TV series, the American TV series, the X Files. The X Files is all about how you get to the truth. You well, anyway, the uh, popular TV series uh, gave you the truth at the end. And then uh, several years ago, there was a revival okay, of the X Files, a continuation. The X Files. Anyway, the truth is out there. So, then, okay, the, uh, it's the truth is out there, but can you get the truth? We don't know. And in postmodernism, we emphasize diversity and multiplicity. So it is not singularity. It is not monolithic. It's not just one thing, one thought. It is multiplicity. That's important. And border crossing, so people do cross art form creations. We emphasize cross cultural communication and so on. Hybridity, so we live we are living in a very hybrid society. Actually, a mixing of culture, culture influencing each other, interlinking culture and so on. Okay, that's very beautiful. Now, are we living in modernity or postmodernity? I already touched on it a couple of times. Um, in what I have been saying, now postmodernism, slide number 11, slide number 11, postmodernism is a description of reality and an interpretation of our living condition. It is not stating the truth about reality. Bear this in mind. Now, we are not all, or not all of us are living in postmodernity. Now, each individual has various uh, different experiences. 
sector in terms of class, in terms of religion, in terms of gender and sexuality, in terms of community, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of economic background and this one of class. So we may have, I mean, each of us we have very different experience of our reality. So not all people experience postmodernity. Not every person experiences postmodernity the same way. And some people are experiencing postmodernity, but they they don't use the concept to describe it. Well, actually, the COVID nineteen condition is in many ways very postmodern. Can you get to the truth? How many got infected? Why they died, and so on? Come on, you got the truth? You think you got the truth? Okay. Now, some theories say that we are in transition from modernity to postmodernity. Or maybe in some places on Earth, slide number 14, slide number 14. Or maybe some places, some people are in transition from modernity back to pre modernity. Back to not the future, but back to modernity, back to pre modernity. Okay, so uh, reality is very complex. There are many different things happening at the same time. Okay? Those things are different, those things may be contradictory to each other. So reality is not just one singular thing. Okay, now let's move on. Next slide, slide 15, slide 15. When we talk about postmodern cultural politics, there are two attitudes. One is an active attitude, slide 15, slide 15. And another is a passive attitude that is very cynical. So let's all try to be engaged, socially engaging, and adopt an active and critical attitude toward our reality. We could criticize the center, right? Instead of just the standing on the roadside and then laughing at other people, assuming that I know everything about the real world. So you guys are stupid. So I am going to stand alone and then protect myself. You guys die. Okay. No, 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 no. We try to change society. We try to engage society. We try to understand the truth. We try to understand the injustice and so on. We try to make society just and fair as far as possible. So let's engage. Yeah, postmodern is can be very engaging. Okay. Postmodern salient features in cultural production. Now we are going to go through five categories. Okay, five categories. And in each category, I am going to cite from Hong Kong movies to illustrate the point. Now the important features, salient features, point number one, slide 17, slide 17, slide 17. Five categories to look into the features of postmodernism. Slide 17, point number one, the breakdown of the distinction between culture and society. So society is real, right? When we talk about culture and movie, which is not real, which is an imagination, but in postmodern culture, it seems that the boundary is not so clear anymore. Uh, some, some people may be modeling their lives on movies. So the movies can be more real than social life. Okay, point number two, style over substance. In postmodern society, we overemphasize or emphasize and overemphasize appearances, okay, style. Well, just look at fashion. Are you consuming the substance or consuming the style? Of course, we're consuming the style. Okay, point number three, the breakdown of the distinction between art and popular culture. So, in our social reality or in our reality, a cultural reality, it is getting more and more difficult to differentiate between high culture and popular culture or low culture, high culture, low culture. A lot of cultural productions are actually forcing boundaries or hybridizing, combining high and low culture. And category number four, confusions over time and space. Now, in a lot of postmodern cultural productions or postmodern films and so on, we are talking about film here. Uh, you you often see a confusion of time and space. You don't know where you are, time travel, and then so what about the space or place that we are living in, and then suddenly you travel together. And the theme, uh, that those kinds of themes usually do not give you a clear cut answer. I'm just citing them as an example. But in your real life, um, yeah, did you have experience of some kind of recognition or some kind of awareness? Mm, 
It seems as things are not that real. Anyway, COVID-19 is very real. Okay, as uh, category number five, the decline of meta-narratives. Okay, meta-narratives in Chinese, you would say, Dai Xu Shu, okay, Dai Zhi Shu. So it is a dominant way of talking about things that people have to follow you. But in postmodernism, we descend, we descend all the meta narratives. Each individual would have his or her own stories that is equally important. Each of, each of you is a subject, is a human subject. Well, you have your own micro stories to tell, and micro stories are not unimportant. Can be as important as things. Okay, so one by one. Next slide, slide 18, slide 18, category number one, the breakdown of distinction between culture and society. So pop culture determines consumption in our reality. Slide 18, slide 18. Now we are living in a, a in a social reality, in a cultural reality, much um, saturated with popular culture. Uh, point number two here, slide 18. We are living in a social order of the dominance of media images. Now, especially with the rise of digital media, social media, internet, we are almost like 24 hours inundated, okay, submerged in media. Yeah, digital media. I mean, I, I myself spend so much time. Yeah. 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 The questions in the chat room. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's me. I, I would like to ask. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You said. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, in postmodernism, it becomes a micro narrative, like everyone will share his story. But beforehand, uh, how about meta narratives, like who constitute it, or is that some powerful man in society who who control the narratives, uh, like to control the history? So, is that how we interpret it? Uh -huh. Hi, Louis Why Hey, right? Why Hey? Well. I think uh, to a great extent, what you just said already partially answered your own question. <laughs> yeah, very smart. Yes, Why but just to confirm like who, who, who constitute right, it. Right, okay, good. It's a good question. Now, but I would like to clarify one concept before uh, 3011, what you raised, okay? Why, why hate? Um, so it is not... I mean, when we think we should, when you think about reality, we should not put reality into a linear sequence, okay? Because what you just said was in a linear sequence that because you asked, okay, before the micro narratives, who constitute, who or what constituted the meta narrative? So you already assumed that after the meta narratives, we have the micro narratives. No, 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 it is not like that. I mean, they coexist. And now we, we, are, we are living in a society with a lot of meta-narratives, okay? Now, like uh, uh, up there, we are overwhelmed by a lot of official, I mean, in the US, in Europe, everywhere, okay? Official sayings, okay? Official narratives about COVID-19. And even one single government would not be giving out just one manner, one meta-narrative, meaning official narrative. That is seeming very important, very dominant uh, about COVID-19. I mean, even one single government would be giving up slightly different messages. And their own meta-narratives are not coherent, actually. But those are meta-narratives because they come from an authority, a power, a government, or a person with power, anyway, with influence. So they speak with authority. They write things with authority. Now, at the same time, we try, some people, some people try to come up with different uh, angles, different perspectives to talk about things. So anyway, you are right in pointing out that, okay, meta-narratives are constituted by dominant society, by communities with power, and so on and so forth. Now, meta narrative is not just about a government. Now, let me cite one one example to illustrate a point. Now, in in society, any community, any group, uh, it could be an ac academic group, but for any community that carries some kind of power and authority, that community would come up with their own and we use another term, discourse, okay, way of talking about things to give you power. 
So in in the law community, they have their own discourse. So they go wah yu hua yu. Okay, they constitute they they use their knowledge to constitute a certain kind of discourse to justify their powerful position. Now, even what I'm talking about, I I I mean, as someone who's doing cultural studies, who's someone who's doing literary studies or film studies, theater studies, performance studies. I mean, in ah、uh, in this kind of academic communities. We came up with specific theories and concepts, and those theories and concepts are discourses by themselves. And those discourses, and those discourses actually authorizes what we are talking about, saying that oh, oh, we address something that is yeah, 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 addressing reality. And what we are saying is helpful in our understanding of reality or in explaining reality. So meta narratives, yeah. Or、uh, if you use history as an example, now in traditional Chinese hi- historical narratives, the so-called official twenty-four histories, okay, 一十四页的二十四史 the twenty in imperial China, okay, the twenty-four, twenty not just twenty-four volumes, but let me just say the twenty-four volumes of histories, okay, in imperial China. So they are official history, they are meta narratives, but at the same time. Among the people, there have, there have been a lot of anecdotes, stories told about common life and so on. So all the time, there's always meta narratives and micro narratives by the ordinary people existing together. Okay, now let's go on. Why he? Okay, now I refer you back to eighteen slide eighteen, the breakdown of the distinction between culture and society. So we are living in cultural.、Uh, I mean, media images, appearances, and style. So our social reality is mostly defined by images. Now this is, of course, modern argument. Well,、yeah. uh, so Hong Kong students, local students. Oh well, not necessarily. I, I'm wrong.、Uh, for non-local students, you probably you have visited this district in Hong Kong. This is Causeway Bay Sogo. Sogo, okay. Causeway Bay Sogo. What is the point of this image? The point is. We are overwhelmed by images everywhere.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, advertisements, commercial signs. So here is a slightly different composition of the same. Yeah,、uh, shot. Another composition. A night view, Causeway Bay, Sogo area. Another angle. Okay. We have the same site, same location. An empty street. Now, this is a shot taken from the movie 2014, directed by Trick Chen. The midnight after, the midnight after. 咩那一年我搭了就望过去大埔的。Ben Wah, the Chinese title is long, 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 long. Okay. Anyway, the English title is the midnight after. It's a crazy movie. It's a very political movie, a very meaningful movie. But a lot of people hated it because it doesn't make sense after all. It doesn't explain anything. Anyway. So this is very very symbolic, symbolic especially to us living here and now, 2022, amid COVID-19 in Hong Kong. Because if you check Causeway Bay in the last two weeks, you see much, much less people than the regular or normal Causeway Bay outside Seoul. We are living in new normal. Now, if you want to locate this、uh, scene in a movie, it is、uh, one hour and thirty-seven minutes. Okay, midnight after. Now, midnight after reminded me of this two thousand two film. Well, I'm easy. I just、yeah. want. To, did you share your screen with to us already? No,、uh, I'm referring you to. Sorry, I forgot. Slide twenty-three. Slide twenty-three. Sorry, slide twenty-three. My, did you share your screen? I, I because we no, have no, no, no. I did not. <laughs> okay, okay. I did not. Okay, slide twenty-three. That is the midnight after. Okay, got it. You want? You got it. You read. Hello. Yeah, slide twenty-three. Slide twenty-four. Now here is a still picture from the movie that came out two thousand two. It's a very famous movie. It's also a zombie movie. It was Song Xiebi. So Danny Boy, yeah, one of the great directors. Um, twenty-eight days later. Ah,、uh, this is、uh, from the beginning of the movie. An empty London. Empty London. Uh, scary. So, uh, the midnight after is kind of inspired by this a little bit. 
So sometime in the future world, yeah, COVID-19 is uh, this kind of eerie. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you compare and contrast the two scenes, okay, bingo. So this is some kind of future world, dystopian world in modernity. Now in show business, in show biz, slide 26, okay, slide 25, you have a juxtaposition. I go back to slide 25, we have a juxtaposition of Causeway Bay and London, empty, all empty from two movies. All right, slide 26, slide 26. In show business, in show business, we sell images, we buy images, we consume images. Slide 27, slide 27. Okay, category number two. Style over substance in postmodernity. We don't care about content. We don't care about substance. What is what we care is style. Okay. So we have this kind of designer ideology. Slide twenty-seven. I believe that our young students in the class are, in one way or another, wearing uh, branding accessories <laughs> or clothes and so on, uh, and and most of the names are French, and I hope that. You have taken some French in order to pronounce those names, close your French pronunciation. Anyway, I always make fun of this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm not a French person. I, I, I mean, I only talk French 101. And Lisa Lung is much better than French, okay? And in our department, our previous chair, Professor Megan Morris, French is excellent. Megan Morris is a film critic, yeah well-renowned, and she is yeah, fluent in French. Uh, and anyway, designer uh, ideology. But to be politically correct, I must point out that in the fashion world, there are quite a few non-European, non-Caucasian famous designers, okay? Some are Chinese, of, of Chinese origin, some are Japanese origin, okay? Uh, a lot of Japanese, equal and Korean, yeah, they're equally great. Anyway, but the point is designer ideology. Okay, second one. The second point, slide 27. And we don't talk about usefulness because you buy a certain commodity because of its look, because of its style. You're not really using it. So what is the point? I mean, what is the big difference between buying a pair of sneakers of 90 something these and with $2,000 and then a $200 pair of sneakers? The function is the same. They serve the same purpose. It's not the usefulness that matters. It is the style, the image that matter more. Okay, so we live in virtual reality. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We are not talking virtual reality. Actually, I'm talking to myself in the phone in virtual reality. So I'm enjoying myself. Okay, very good. Style over substance. Now, virtual reality. Real estate in uh, TVC now. In in living in postmodernity, yes, there is another aspect that I'm not going into details here. But let me men mention it here. Now, living in postmodernity, a lot of us have lost our sense of history, and we have a sense of nostalgia. We we lost something in the past. We try to get it back, but we don't have a good sense of history to know our history well or something. So this kind of post modern nostalgia, it's um, yeah, it, it it is useless. It is uh, um, it could be not very uh, positive. It could be not positive energy. But what I'm going to do in just one second is very positive. We look back at a moment in Hong Kong popular culture, in Hong Kong society that was so full of energy. And we will take it very critically to reflect on our life right now. Now I refer you back to your slide, slide 28, slide 28. All right, slide 29, slide 29, style and images, Madonna. Now, Madonna became famous in the 1980s and she is still the Madonna well, for 40 years. Now I would like to share this quote by a British cultural critic with you. Really, the point here is I over substance. Quote, slide 29, slide 29. Quote, dance, she means Madonna. Madonna danced better than she looked. She sang better than she danced. Everybody has a girlfriend who can sing better than her. 
Now, this is, you can say it, a, a kind of British humor, very sarcastic, but point to our reality of, well, you don't need substance. Well, to be fair, Madonna can sing to a great extent, not the best singer, not the best pop singer from the United States or from the whole world. There, there are a handful of really excellent singers in terms of technique, but Madonna, well, well, it's okay. Um, Madonna is famous not because she her, because of her technique of dance or singing, but because of her images. She kept changing her images. Okay, style over substance. Now we go to style of Wong Kar Wai. This movie still still picture. This movie still is just classic of the classic. It's classic of Wong Kar Wai. It's classic of the movie. One of the most famous movie made or well loved movie made by Wong Kar Wai, Chongqing Express in so Hong Kong, Chongqing. You go to Jinsa Street, the Chongqing Mansion, okay? For those non local students as well as local students, you might want to at least check out the entrance. Well, not, not right now, okay? I cannot encourage you to go right now because of COVID 19. But anyway, Chongqing Express. So uh, there's a lot of borrowing from Murakami Haruki. Oh, well, anyway. Uh, Yvonne is a Japanese expert here. Now, Murakami is a family name. Now, Murakami is a family name. Uh, Haruki is a given name. Uh, he's a, uh, one of the most Japanese famous writer, novelists, and he's been nominated um, a couple of times for the Nobel Prize in Literature, but he hasn't got it yet. Really, a couple of times, maybe four or five times he was nominated. And, uh, oh, uh, his name is in Panji, in Chinese character, Chunza, Chunji, okay. Fan Zhang, Chun Shu, okay. Murakami Haruki. Uh, Murakami Haruki, uh, I read a couple of his novels in English translation. Uh, he's really great. It's really great. He is still producing, yeah, very um, productive. And he's very postmodern. He's so postmodern. And Wong Kar Wai picked up some of the elements from Murakami Haruki. And every time when I heard from the news that, oh, Murakami Haruki, Hal Haruki is once again nominated for the Nobel Prize. And I, and I update every time I update. If I were Murakami Haruki, I wouldn't care for Nobel Prize literature. Who cares? I am Murakami Haruki. Murakami Haruki is much bigger than Nobel Prize. Come on. Anyway, so they're talking about postmodern here. Okay. So look at all the blurred images, okay, flashy, just the surface, and it is glamorous, and then who cares about anything else? Uh, let's go back to the PowerPoint, 32, 32, 37 now, uh, I mean 33, slide 33, 0 0.01 cm. Okay, I'm going to skip another clip uh, because of the time limit. Um, in Chongqing Express, a movie, the 0.01 cm is repeated a couple of times throughout the movie. It's Murakami. Okay, point number three about uh, category number three of postmodern features. Ah, okay, why hey? Interesting. I just saw your chat. Why hey? Okay, <laughs> yeah. The drunken camera map. Nice comment. Okay, slide 34, slide 34. Category four, uh, three, postmodernism. The breakdown of the distinction between art and popular culture. Art by art, popular culture. Well, Wong Wong Kawai already is a very good example. Uh, some of the very, um, um, some of the best selling film directors in Hong Kong uh, are utterly commercial and no one would con consider their films as art. Um, Wong Kawai has been considered as an art film director, but to me, he, he is crossing the boundary between the mainstream or the commercial and the art film. I mean, he, his, his films are not art films like uh, Fellini or that kind of really very boring and art artist, <laughs> art film from Europe. Um, he is successful. Successful not in the sense of like Hollywood commercial movies like Terminator or that kind of thing, but he is successful also commercially up to the scale of his films. And in his films, he very um, ambiguously said something and he uses postmodern artistic technique. So he's crossing the boundary himself. Okay, now slide 34, slide 34. 
art becomes increasingly in integrated into the economy. Art becomes a commercial good. Anybody who could be anybody could be an artist right, in the show business. And any artist could become an artist. And anybody now is a photographer if you're mobile phone and a filmmaker if you are mobile phone. Now let's continue with this breakdown, distinction, breakdown of distinction between art and pop culture. Slide 35, slide 35. Now in this breaking down, we have a mode of expression that we call playfulness, a mode of expression that uses parody a lot to make fun of serious art, to make fun of previous art in your own production. Slide 35, playfulness, playful attitude. It is most, um, it is most completely expressed in Stephen Chow, Chow Zing Chi, okay, Chow Zing Chi. And in Hong Kong culture, we back then we coined the term from the, from the 1990s through the uh, 2000s. Mo Lei Tao in Cantonese, Wu Li Tao, okay, in Tonghua, Mo Lei Tao. Now, um, they, 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 they just adopt a very farcical, crazy, playful attitude. That kind of playful attitude is often also a parody of some serious artwork or some previous work, as I just said, okay? They turn everything into a joke, slide 35. Now, let us look at, okay, here is a list of, okay, 36. Here is a list of the film director, a list of films by the film director, Lao Chan Wai, Lao Chan Wai. Well, forget about his list. He is very famous in directing this movie. Uh, he directed many uh, commercially successful movies. Our savior of the soul, Now I'm going to show you one scene to illustrate the point. Uh, I have, I mean, there are a couple of uh, good scenes from this movie to illustrate the point, but I'm going to just show you one, okay. Um, I'm going to share again to illustrate the point of parody, playfulness and so on. And, Everything turned into a joke. Nothing is serious. Oh, by the way, before I forget, uh, watch that. Okay. In one of the Batman movies, one of the most acclaimed Batman movies from Hollywood, um, The Dark Knight, okay, Batman, The Dark Knight. And actually, the one who um, all got our heart is. Um, Heath Ledger, the actor who passed away some years ago, yeah, who played Joker in the movie, Batman, uh, Dark Knight. And Heath Ledger's Joker in the movie has many quotable quotes. And one of them is, Joker says, why so serious? Why so serious? Okay, so let's look at the not serious thing. And let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, next slide, 38, 38, slide 38. So reference and quotation, as I just mentioned, is something that is important for us to look in postmodern cultural production. So there are two techniques, actually, first from uh, painting, the collage and pastiche. Okay, collage, you just put different images from different contexts, different works previously existing onto one plane. And pastiche is with an intention to make fun of a previous work. So there is a slight difference between collage and pastiche. In collage, you just put things together. In pastiche, you have the intention to laugh and make fun of it. And with all these kind of quoting, citing, borrowing from existing works, so in postmodern cultural creation, originality, is kind of disappearing or dying because we just quote and quote and quote make reference to existing or previous works. So let's look at some visuals, I mean still pictures. Now here is a poster for uh, Chongqing Express. This is classic, classic collage. And here is a kind of postmodern nostalgia again, because next magazine is no more. Back in 2014, I have got this collage from Nick's magazine. 
And most recently, from the 2019 movie Witness Out of the Blue, with Gu Tianlong. Gu Tianlong is called Lu Yi, Lu Yi Ku. Lu Yi Ku, okay, Gu Tianlong, okay, a respectable filmmaker, actor. Uh, this is collage, so it's here as scenes from a uh, different context from the movie. And then in uh, commercial cinema, of course, you need to sell the stars. So you often have the big heads of the uh, stars of the movie. So once again, collage. Okay, quick, 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 passage and hybridity and the eclectic play of styles and services. Slide 44. Slide 44. Now here is a further elaboration on the use of each in postmodern cultural production, hybridity, everything just put together without, with or without logical reason. And parody is a very important or, yeah, really much used or even overused mode of expression in postmodern. Slide 46, slide 46. Now here is, uh, let me introduce a concept which we call intertextuality, okay, intertextuality. That is, okay, if you cite someone, we use the term intertextuality, we can use the term intertextuality to describe it. If you borrow something or if you copy without acknowledging something that is plagiarizing, it's also intertextual. Intertextuality is, is a neutral term to describe this kind of Text referring to text, okay, text interreferencing each other. Now, the concept basically is that a word can only mean something when it refers to another word. A word by itself cannot mean anything. So, any word is actually already an intertext because a text has to refer to another text or the other texts in order to mean something. So a text cannot exist by itself. So every text is an intertext. So the concept is there. Now in postmodern cultural productions, intertextuality is very, very prevalent. Slide 47, slide 47. I am going to skip this TV commercial because of the timing. And that is, okay, so let's watch it. Because it is so classic, it is so classic collage pastiche intertextuality in, in which you have reference to um, modern Chinese culture, modern Chinese woodblock painting, and you have referencing to Japanese popular culture, European culture, uh, diamonds, jewelry, pop, J pop, candle pop, everything. Okay, we, we should watch this. Once again, postmodern postmodern nostalgia. Let me get the clip ready. Anyway, this is only 30 seconds. So uh, now sharing 30 seconds. Now this is a jewelry commercial. Now pay attention first to the visual image see the style and the hybridizing and the quotation of sources from different cultures, different kinds of culture, high culture, low culture, Chinese, Japanese, European, American, Hong Kong, and Hong Kong. Okay, now 30 seconds. Uh, jewelry and accessory TV commercial. The embrace emphasis. <laughs> The embraced emphasis. Well, what I'm going to say is 48, slide 48, slide 48. Now, Stephen Charles Kung Fu Hustle is classic. Uh, we we can see a lot of postmodern features in it. I'm not saying that everything in it is postmodern, but we have some postmodern. And there's a lot of intertext from this movie, Kung Fu Hustle, because it keeps referring to uh, martial art movies, Hong Kong, dancer movies, and so on and so forth, Hollywood to meet me, meet me, what's that, the road run? Yeah, 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 the American animation, TV animation. 
I grew up with the uh, roadrunner generation uh, from the 1960s, so I'm very old now. Um, so it is to illustrate in the text. Now, what I'm going to do is slide number 49, slide number 49. I am going to point out, well, that's no need for me to, I mean, this is not my discovery because everyone with knowledge of the intertext would recognize it immediately. And that is also part of the pleasure of what we think for those people who know the intertext because of our old age or something. I am going to point out the original text that Stephen Charles Kung Fu has referred to in this, in this scene. Okay, first let's go to this. This is the fight scene from Kung Fu Hustle. Now, this is a comedy. I mean, Kung Fu Hustle is a comic movie. And um, this combat scene, hand to hand combat scene, definitely is entertaining as action, but it is not serious. It's jokingly done, especially the music cited. The music is a kind of um, uh, Chinese orchestral music. Which, which is supposed to be traditional, which was composed uh, through the 1950s and so on, um, supposed to be traditional, but using the, uh, the European orchestral model, so what we say, that's the music used in the 1950s and 1960s, up to the early 1970s, Hong Kong, Cantonese, black and white sword play martial art movies. So we grew up in the 1960s and we were so accustomed to and familiar with all that kind of music already. Okay, what about the original text or the original, not original, I mean the intertext, that's nothing original. Okay, I need to stop chair and then go back. To, let me show you the, uh, the 1965. The 1965 uh, black and white Cantonese Hong Kong made martial arts sort play movie that Stephen Chow borrowed from or parodied in his Kung Fu Hustle. Okay, so this is a movie called The Six Fingered Evil Loot Player. Now, loot is a wrong translation and there is no correct translation because we don't know what that instrument is. I mean, similar kinds of uh, traditional Chinese instruments. We have the gu qin, ha gu ba, and we have the sat. Okay, sat is what's it? Anyway, uh, sat is too old in the Zhao Dynasty or something. And in the Japanese term, it's kodo. Okay, and that family of instrument. But the making of the Cantonese movie back then was so lousy that the instrument was hard to begin on as well. Anyway, it's a six-fingered evil loop play. It is supposed to be gu qin, but it was not a gu qin. A lot deeper, more. So it, it, the story was remade and remade later on. Okay. So it's an example of intertext post modern intertext. Now, Savior of the Soul, I'm going to skip it again because it's just from the same movie, the illustrator in another point. Uh, okay, because the time is running out, but um, I will skip some, but keep some. Now, when we talk about parody, we, let me cite an example from Stephen Charles' movie, from Beijing with Love, uh, from 1994. And then the uh, 1996 for Bin City Cop. Now, from Beijing with Love, from the title, you should already recognize if you are familiar with James Bond movies. Now, because the first James Bond movie, I mean, the second James Bond movie, I would say, by Spec Sean Connery, we have five or six James Bond actors up to now, from the 1960s to now. Now, the first James Bond actor is got Sean Connery, who passed away some years ago, several years ago. Sean Connery, who's a very good actor in his later life. Now, the second, the first James Bond movie that came out in the 1960s, the first part of the 1960s, called Top No, okay? Uh, the second James Bond movie is called From Russia with Love, okay? From Russia with Love. Now, this Stephen Chow movie is called From Beijing with Love. It is a parody of a Bond movie. And 1996 for Bin City Cop, it is, um, it is put in the genre of martial art, but it is also a parody of James Bond movie put in uh, the imperial times in China. Now, here is a parody. Um, just very quickly, the, the style of the parody. I'm going to share a screen, and you will be able to recognize immediately from the features. Let me get the clips ready. Now, what I'm going to do is to show you uh, the opening credit sequence from a Bond movie, Quantum of Solace, okay, Quantum of Solace. And then we will check out uh, from Beijing with Love. We go back to the PowerPoint. 
54. Now I have uh, further evidence, but we are going to skip it. And Chongqing experts and so on and so forth, more Wong Kar Wai, I'm going to skip it. Now uh, you, you can often, uh, if you're interested, you can follow the slides to uh, check out the original movies, not the whole movies, but the specific scenes. Now, this is a gangster movie that is a parody of the gangster genre. It's also very personal, but I'm going to skip it too because of the time limit. Okay, another category, category four, confusions over time and space. Now, this is a, um, one of the major characteristics in postmodern narrative, the confusion between uh, now and then and the future. And we don't know, we don't know where we are. Now I'm going to illustrate it with um, a couple of Hong Kong movies, good chance. Uh, in connection with this confusion of space and time, uh, non-linear narrative is a very significant feature in postmodern narrative. It is, it is not a progressive, logical, linear, okay, following a line sequence. It is often, uh, you have many lines, you have many subplots, up the main plot and subplots, but they might not be able to add together. And then the story is often told from a certain point in the future or from the past, and then after 30 minutes, you come back to the present and so on. Now, pop fiction by Quentin Tarantino, slide 60, slide 60, slide 60. Pop fiction by Quentin Tarantino, came out in 1994, has often been quoted been quoted to illustrate non-linear narrative. But pay attention. Now, if you haven't seen it, it's okay. It is very enjoyable. I recommend you to see it. Pop fiction's non-linear narrative. Uh, you can reshuffle it, reorganize it into a logical sequence. But in other postmodern movies, uh, like Fruit Chen, you won't be able to make a logical sense at the end. So pay attention to this difference. Now, Memento, okay, Christopher Nolan, after the Batman movies, he's so famous, okay? Um, uh, Memento is a movie that is really great. Um, it is not a commercial movie, and it is a very exemplary, very exemplary of breaking down a linear narrative. Uh, not a commercial movie, um, but not a kind of boring art movie. Um, I recommend it to you. Um, the narrative, you, yeah, you have to, as the spectator, you use your own uh, reasoning to put it back. Now, J.J. Abrams, since the 2000, late 1990s, became very, very popular since uh, the TV miniseries, uh, not miniseries, the TV series, Lost. Now, that was very exemplary, was one of the early examples of TV uh, series, TV drama that make very smart use of non linear narrative and the mysteries lost. Okay. And Wong Kar Wai, yeah, non linear narrative. And I want to recommend two movies to you a German movie, Run Lola Run. Oh, this is wonderful, but a hundred percent postmodern movie in all ways, in all ways, 360 degree. In Hong Kong is translated as it is just wonderful. Okay. Um, and then the Hong Kong movies, uh, I recommend it for the sake of analysis. It's itself is not uh, really a good movie. It's okay as a commercial movie. It's called One, Two, Three. And the Chinese original Chinese title is a pun on a homonym of a vulgar term. Okay. So it is made up of seven stories that all converge on a convenience store. So this is kind of narrative has been in the past 30 years uh, used a lot in uh, mainstream commercial movies. Different seven, eight stories, but at the end, you connect it through one nodal point. Okay, run Lola run now. Pay attention to the New Yorker theme critics comment here. Uh, slide seven, uh, slide 63, slide 63, slide 63. I often, yeah, forgot to mention the slide number. Okay, slide 63. Here is a comment by a New York Times, New York Times film, film critic on Run, Lola, Run. Once again, I 100% recommend this movie, all smart. 
dazzling. I'm quoting, okay, slide 63, dazzling, playfully profound, fast and pose human. Okay, I'm not going to pose human uh, because of the time limit. And um, okay. Now, slide 64, slide 64, the decline of meta narratives. So we break down the center, we break down the kind of authoritative uh, assertion about reality and life. So we don't need meta narratives to organize our life. We don't need meta narratives to give us meaning. We don't need meta narratives to give us order. We have our own subjectivity, we have our own logical reasoning, we have our knowledge, we have our information to try to get to, to try to understand the world, to try to understand the relation between us and the world. Well, we may not be successful, but we will try. And we have been trying and we are trying, okay? And so in the breaking down of mental narratives and then the breaking down of non-linear narratives, things are turning into fragments, okay? Pieces and pieces are, that are not necessarily linked together logically. And then my life as Macau, an animation from Hong Kong, is a very good illustration of this kind of fragmentation and also more how. Um, there are some uh, good examples that because of the time limit, I'm not going into it all. And uh, now here is an example. Okay, I am going to just uh, share these examples with you from uh, my life as Macau. Now, here is a scene in which language is rendered meaningless. Language is being broken down and communication, communication is broken down because meaning, uh, meanings are erased and language becomes futile. So what do we mean? Let's, let's check out the scene. And we all laughed at it because it was so funny. All right, so um, let's go back to the slide 69, 69. Now, uh, to run, uh, Yvonne, I think I need to overrun a little bit, overrun for 10 minutes. So um, yeah, I, I think the students could feel free as them. Now, lastly, I am going to round up with uh, Fruit Chen's two movies, uh, Fruit Chen. Fruit Chen, is in, well, uh, some people call him an uh, independent filmmaker, and he has some kind of cult, uh, cult characteristics in his movies. His movies are often, yeah, low budget, uh, it's, it's very social oriented, uh, but not a kind of serious social criticism. But he, he is often very crazy. Uh, he, he did make a couple of very serious movies, but anyway, the two that I'm going to say, the two reasons, they are very crazy, low budget, excessively in doing violence, and it's so cheesy, cheesy, he sends it because he has little money to make. And, and the references are immediately social. Um, now, the midnight after, now the Chinese title is so long. I mean, uh, 那一夜我搭上去從旺角到大埔, what the hell? Anyway, the English is midnight after. In Chinese, I, I would just say Hong Kong. Okay, it came out in 2014. 2014 is a year of significance for Hong Kong, and I'm not going to touch upon that. <laughs> okay, so uh, here is a plot summary. I'll leave it for you because of the time limit. Now, anyway, you could say that it is a sci-fi, I am going to skip to 73, slide 73. Now the story goes, it seems that the story goes. Now, first the movie at the end does not explain any connections, does not answer any questions that the spectators would ask. Meaning that we that the movie itself does not give a logical um, answer does not does not give logical answers to all the questions and mystery raised in the movie. Now the movie you can call it sci-fi or dystopian. Now uh, around ten people one night they were at Mong Pop and then they boarded on a red van, the mini van, the public transport, traveling to Tai Po. But then while they, I mean, among the uh, around the ten passengers. It belongs to uh, different kinds of communities, social groups, and so on and so forth, different gender, young, old, and so on. 
educated, not educated, good guys, bad guys, a sampling of Hong Kong people actually. And when they get through the tunnel, suddenly they were transferred to another time and space. Six years ago, six years in the future and so on. And then there's a mysterious guy with a gas mask. And toward the end of the movie, I, I, and then those characters, some of them got killed mysteriously. And then toward the end of the movie, it seems that there is a virus. And everybody rush, rushes into the supermarket and get the protection here and so on and so forth. All right. Now, slide 73, slide 73, The Midnight After 2014 movie. Now, here I have some points for you to note. Now, in terms of genre, slide 73, slide 73, the movie, you could call it a horror. It is about death. It is a story that people get into another dimension. And in terms of genre, you may want, or we would associate it with the Final Destination thing, the Final Destination series from Hollywood. There is no escape from uh, death, the god of death, and there is no way to cheat death. And we would also immediately associate the movie with 28 Days Later that I mentioned before. It is also a thriller. There's a lot of these uh, mysteries in the movie and uh, some bloody scenes, gory. And in a sense, it is post-apocalyptic. That is, they tran they, the, the characters uh, are transported to another time and space that is so dystopian. Okay? And then this, in the movie throughout, when they were, when the characters are transported to another time and space, they often hear radio communication, help, 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 help. There's no uh, logical explanation there. And the movie also cited David Bowie's song that is about space travel and so on. I am not going to, because of the time limit, I cannot go to the analysis, but it is pointing to some very absurd and realistic situation that those characters are facing. Now, slide 74, slide 74. So in the, in, in the movie, um, they, they, there is also a kind of elements of the rate how because many of the events were not connected for cause and effect. There's no logical uh, reasoning. And there is a uh, reference to North Korean and then the Chinese, so er everything from those characters. And it is also a suspense, but it is intentionally made not a conventional type of well-made suspense. Well-made meaning that at the end, you will get every bit of detail, logically. Um, but in this movie, it is, there are a lot of mysterious things, mysterious happenings. That it, they are all not explained. So it's rather more laid out. Okay? And then there is a gas mask guy who is supposed to be Japanese appearing frequently in the movie, but it's never explained why he's there. And then at one point, because the uh, gas mask guy is a Japanese and he speaks Japanese and they use Google Translate, but the, the so here is a, um, just like the, uh, Power of Babel from the Bible. It's a good arm of communication. And they use Google Translate to do it. But it's very interesting. The Google Translate, you have to use, to use a Guo Yu in the Guo uh, Yu, that's Putonghua, in order to activate, uh, in order to do the Google Translate. It is it's, uh, so more And uh, yeah, finally, I use the X-Files and truth is out there to explain it. Now, let, let's go to two moments in the movie okay, to illustrate uh, my points. Two movie, two moments in a movie. I refer you back to the PowerPoint. Coffin Hunt 75, slide 75. Ah, sorry, 78, slide 78, slide 78. Coffin Homes, That's a Cantonese expression. The original title is Gui Tong Mi Shu. This is not standard written Chinese. Gui Tong Mi Shu. Then it only goes to read with you. Okay. Now, Coffin Homes, it is a criticism of the Hong Kong economy based on um, the real estate. Okay. And people spend their whole life trying to buy an apartment and this and that. And they, uh, 
protagonist is a real estate agent, a young guy. His girlfriend is killed, and then there is an apartment, and a vacant apartment that the protagonist is trying to sell, and that is haunted by a ghost. The ghost is very ugly and um, yeah, repugnant. And the ghost actually, many uh, some decades ago, killed his wife and buried his wife into one of the walls in the apartment. And the ghost is uh, very evil and he kills everybody and so on. So I am going to uh, show you, uh, I recommend this movie. It's very fruit churn, uh, very cult, very low budget, uh, with vulgar language and social criticism. So slide 78, slide 78, we have all the characteristics, okay, cult, low budget, a fast, a parody, vulgarity, it is very excessive, okay, it is always in excess, portraying violence and these and that. Now, I'm going to show you two moments from the movie and then uh, that's all for um, my guest lecture. Let me get the movie ready. So, that is all about our uh, postmodern characteristics from various examples of Hong Kong cinema. Okay, uh, I wrap it up here, bring it to a closure. I mean, my guest lecture. I'm okay, thank you. Overrunning. No, 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 Sula, I just wonder <laughs> what is over, overspill? What does it really mean here? Uh, what? Overspill. Uh, overspill. Oh, you say ex excessive. Ex uh, the, the expression, the cinematic expression is all overspilling, it's too much. Uh, all in excessive. Okay. Yeah, okay. All in excess. Everything is excessive. Okay. I mean, like, like doing the bloody scene, the gory portrayal, oh. this is all beyond the limit. Yeah. That's okay. what I'm trying to make. Okay. okay. All right. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed the lecture today. And it, I think it was really funny. And I think I laughed <laughs> for many seats. It's so funny to see them again. So, do you have any questions? All of you here, some ah, someone say have questions. Oh, color, okay, yeah, uh, colorful blood spreading out, but uh, I think it's water, right? It's not really. It's like it's, it's like water, not not really blood, right? Any other? Any no questions? No. Okay, so thank you very much again to Siula. Okay, thank you very much for your time oh, and thank you for attending. Thank you for locking. I will. In. I will okay. say. I will email them your email address. Okay, and then just mm -hmm. in case they want to get in touch with you. Okay. Okay, so thank you so long. Okay, bye guys. Oh, bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Bye guys. Bye everyone. So bye. Yeah, yes. I think this is great. Yeah, we have funny lectures and uh, I. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> Always why hey? Okay, why hey? All right. Yeah, yeah. And May Ting. Okay, thank you, thank you. And Hangy. Okay. Uh, see you okay. chat. So yeah. see you okay, again. Yeah, Lam Chat Ming Derek. I think it's Derek, right? Yeah, yep. yeah, okay. So thank you again, okay. And uh I will uh yeah, keep uh, yeah, I will I will send them your email address later on. Mm -hmm. Thanks so long. Okay, please take a break and rest and I know that you have another class in the evening. Another class at seven, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. How okay, are you doing? Bye -bye. Okay, I'm talk to you later. Okay, bye. I'm leaving out. Bye. Okay, bye. bye.